Okay, let's get started. Welcome everyone. My name is Boo Rothstein. I'm a professor here in government and public policy. And I think that the nice thing of being in Oxford is that you don't have to travel so much because everything that is interesting comes here. And today we have an example of this. I'm very honored and pleased to introduce to you Robert Rothbay. And his most important distinction is that he took his doctorate at St. Anthony's College here in Oxford while he was a Rhodes Scholar. Then comes that he is a founding director of Harvard's Kennedy School Program of Intrastate Conflict and President Emeritus of the World Peace Foundation. He has been the president of the Lafayette College and academic vice president of Tufts University and professor of political science at MIT. He's a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and among his most well-known and highly cited books are When States Fail, Causes and Consequences, Governance and Leadership in Africa, and now, I'm sure this will be a landmark study, this book, The Corruption Cure. And this is what I have had to say about it. it and it is on the back cover. This book is a veritable to the force, both intellectually and in scope. Rothbay is one of the most knowledgeable researchers in this field, and he also has impressive experience from practical efforts and policies for reducing corruption. I am convinced that curing corruption will become a standard reference for a long time. I have also two of my colleagues here. Dr. Jody Laporte, Dr. Maya Tudor, who will serve as discussants and with some comments. And uh, yes, without further ado, please, Robert, the floor is yours. Let me uh, talk standing, then I can see you all. Uh, but the first thing is, uh, I, I was enormously pleased that uh, Bo said good things about the book uh, because his, my book stands on his work and the work of others. Uh, he was the pioneer in this field. He's made uh, it much easier for those of us who have followed uh, and he continues to be a thought leader as well as a practical leader in this very important area. Thank you, Bo. Uh, uh, now, I don't think this is the right audience, but I'm going to start by asking those of you who have ever paid a bribe to raise your hands. Uh, that's not too many. Uh, my students in Brazil, 50-60% uh, would have raised their hands, somewhat sheepishly, but they would have raised their hands. My students in Zambia would have raised their hands 90%, and the other 10% would have been shy. So there's a huge difference. Uh, but what we do know is that uh, corruption is everywhere in the developing world and even in a place like Sweden. It's not that Swedes necessarily expect to pay bribes as they go to the airport. That hasn't happened for a century or so. Uh, but we do know that Swedish firms pay overseas bribes. And we do know, my favorite case, because she was a student of mine, is that Gulnara Karamova, the daughter of the president of Uzbekistan, solicited and received bribes from uh, Telenora of Sweden, joined with a Finnish company, and in another case with a Russian-Swedish bribe. So, so corruption is alive and well everywhere, but it's particularly dangerous in the developing world where uh, 
one or two percent of GDP per annum is lost. The World Bank claims, we don't know the rights of this figure, that a trillion dollars is lost every year to corruption in the developing world. Uh, earlier today, I was told, again, we can't check these numbers very easily, that 30 percent of Nigeria's GDP since 1965 has gone missing, gone to corruption. That's an enormous loss. And what was the figure you said at lunch, Bo, for how many millions of people? Uh, 2.6 million, was it, that uh, are really our lives are impacted on a daily basis in the developing world. Now that's, we're talking, uh, we're talking uh, three-fifths to four-fifths of humanity at any one time is infected by the corruption taint. That means they're missing out on something. They're missing out on a developmental opportunity. Um, they, um, they are um, losing parts of themselves uh, to an elite class that is sucking their very life innards from them to, en to, en to enrich themselves. So the book, The Corruption Cure, is not so much about corruption because Bo and many others have written ex extensively about it and there's no need for further work on what corruption is. This book is an, is an attempt to um, s show how we can shift countries from being wildly corrupt to being less corrupt or not corrupt at all. Um, some jurisdictions have made this leap historically. Some have made this leap in the 20th century. Some are a few are making it in the 21st century. So the question before us is how to eradicate self-dealing at the expense of the public good. That's a very uh, simple notion, hard to, uh, to achieve. Um, the American Continental Congress said to Ben Franklin, you may not take the jewel-encrusted snuff box that Louis XIV has just given you because it's not appropriate for a leader of these United States, not quite the United States then, uh, to take anything from a foreign monarch be or a foreign person because it will influence your, your views. That's the origin, by the way, of the, uh, the, uh, the Emoluments Clause, which is being adjudicated in that distant country that separated from this one some time ago. Um, some Americans would wish to be back under the crown. Maybe not after next week, but who knows. Um, now, there are, there are a, a series of common sense methods to shift a country from being less corrupt to, uh, from being more corrupt to less, less corrupt. Clearly, and this has been tried often, you can um, ratchet up punishment. You can send the judges out on the assizes and you can uh, catch the crooks and you can imprison them and that works to some extent. This is what uh, a fearless judge in Brazil is attempting to do now. Uh, you can do what the Brazilian judge Moro is attempting to do is to go one step beyond punishment which is to end impunity. So he's attempting to make sure, unlike uh, affairs in Brazil from 2006 to two, two, 2011, that the politicians are punished and punished in a way that they don't return so that their impunity is dealt with. Uh, it's very important in, in all cases to remove discretion, to make it much harder for politicians and civil servants to give out favors. Um, uh, in 4000 BC in India, this question was realized and, and uh, it was written about as something that has to be guarded against. So this is, not, this is nothing new. Um, 
nowadays, uh, the book talks about this at some greater length, countries like Kenya or Zambia or Malawi can put all interactions between citizens and the bureaucracy online. That, uh, that l eliminates discretion to a great deal of extent. It makes it much harder to discriminate against or in favor and is one of the great tools that we're using. Um, we can empower civil society and citizens to use the computers we carry in our pockets to um, photograph bribe taking, to report bribe taking uh, in places as, as, as anomalous as Kazakhstan and uh, Tajikistan, uh, webcams are being used sometimes surreptitiously to photograph policemen shaking down motorists for bribes. So these are, these are, these are instruments that can be used. Uh, it's also possible to use machine learning to discover hotspots of bribery and to begin to police those, those hotspots. Uh, so what you need are good, good laws, first of all, and you need good laws domestically, and most countries, including the most corrupt, have very good laws. Uh, it's not the laws in most cases that are needed. And nowadays, the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act uh, of the United States, the British Anti-Bribery Act, the OECD uh, strictures against corruption, uh, the Canadian, the Belgian, the French have all instituted methods of going after uh, their companies to prevent their companies from getting away tax-free, but also getting away with bribing, bribing over, uh, overseas citizens. So the legal instruments are now much stronger than they were, but they're not sufficient. Uh, uh, most important, as uh, many people have written about, is the need for greater transparency. Uh, sunshine is the most important thing in corrupt act activities. Therefore, one needs a free press. One needs uh, a series of ombudspersons. The public protector in South Africa has done signal work in bringing uh, President Zuma to book. Uh, one needs um, investigatory commissions. Uh, I'll talk a bit more about Hong Kong in a second. Um, one can use auditors, um, ombudspersons, but all of these efforts are, are not sustainable unless one changes the culture of the the political culture of the country. One socialization and a, and acculturation are critical. Uh, there, I, I must mention, because we're in this town that uh, five or six centuries ago, uh, the uh, good citizens of many medieval English towns simply weighed their leaders at the end of every year. And if they weighed more than they had the previous year, they were assumed to have lived off the fatted calf and to have benefited. And so they punished those leaders who weighed more than they weighed the previous year. That was a very easy way and an important way to hold their leaders to, uh, to, uh, to account. But those methods eventually went into dis disuse, but they weren't as sustainable or as useful as uh, more, 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 more thorough methods. The key to sustainability in moving from corruption to less, less corruption is transforming the collectivity. That's what this book is in large part about, shifting a nation gradually to what uh, various people, including Bo, have referred to as 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 ethical uni universalism. So shifting shifting the mindset, the political value system, the political culture, as many of us in political science talk, from accepting corruption to regarding it as something which is not only punishable, but wrong. 
And it's that shift which has enabled certain, certain countries, and I'll talk about them very, very briefly. And the key to most of these shifts, in fact, uh, I would say all of these shifts, is when strong, sometimes autocratic leaders have shown the way. Leadership is, the, the, this book says, uh, is the critical variable in moving a jurisdiction from corruption to, to non-corruption. Uh, non, non the metaphor is a very simple one. Uh, corruption begins at the top, so one must cut off the head of the snake, and then the coils will wriggle and corruption will be no more. Let's take a look very quickly, much too quickly, at Singapore. Are there Singaporeans here? Uh, Singapore was wildly corrupt. I can't even ex accept, accept to say that it was like Macau on steroids. Uh, before 1959, Lee, came, Lee Kuan Yew came into office. He had been a uh, legal advisor to the trade unions. Uh, he was well versed in Singaporean corruption, well aware of what was going on. He knew that corruption would finish him as a leader. So when the Malaysian Federation ended in 1965, and he was established as Singapore's um, single most important leader, he determined to end corruption. And what he did was to set example, A, by not being corrupt himself, uh, but B, by making it clear to people close to him, uh, his ministers, his deputy prime, uh, prime, prime minister, and anyone who, got, who was tempted by corruption was immediately let go and often sent to court, tried, and uh, convicted eventually. So Lee's method was to make an example of every, everyone around him who was corrupt within a, a relatively short period of time, 10 years at most, Singapore was uh, mostly free of corruption as it is today. It's not that there aren't Cases of corruption in Singapore, there have been a few recently, but most of them are brought in from outside, from, from uh, Malaysia, uh, from China, from elsewhere. There are hardly any Singaporeans who ever come before the courts nowadays. Uh, that was due to Lee um, using his broom very strongly. The same thing happened under a different sort of circumstances circumstances in Hong Kong, where before 1974, Hong Kong under British rule, Singapore under British rule, Hong Kong under British rule, had been, uh, again, wildly corrupt. Uh, I call Singapore a pirate swamp, a corrupt pirate swamp. Hong Kong was much the same. Uh, and there was a huge scandal in, in the 1970s. British uh, police officers were complicit with Chinese gangs had been for 50 or 60 years, uh, except for the Japanese period. And um, a British governor came in, realized he had to do something, uh, created an anti-corruption commission, which is still the model for such commissions around the world. And within 10 years of making it clear that corruption was not something which was appropriate for Hong Kong, and he did this by finding the corrupt uh, politicians and civil servants and removing them, but he also did this by empowering the Anti-Corruption Commission to go to every government office and make them very clear that corruption was no longer permitted, and then to go to the schools and educate the upcoming generations over 20 years about the dangers of, of uh, corruption. And so the collectivity shifted in its mindset. Uh, this also happened, as uh, Bo and others have written about, in the Nordic countries. They weren't always non-corrupt. Um, 
and in places like New Zealand, Canada, the Netherlands, uh, Frederick the Great's Prussia, and so on. Uh, and uh, I, I, if one reads Felix Holt, one has some very good pages about corruption in the uh, rotten boroughs of Britain in the 19th century. So that this is, there has been a shift, uh, largely leadership-led, and, uh, and it, that has made countries such as, uh, small countries such as Singapore and Hong Kong, move from corrupt to less, less corrupt. Uh, this is happening in the 21st century in Rwanda under very tight rule. Um, one of my Kennedy School students and I were walking the streets of Kigali a few years ago, and I said, how's the crime rate? Well, she said, we don't have crime. I said, but Nairobi has crime and Kampala has crime. She said, no, no, he doesn't allow it. She said, and then I said, what about corruption? She said, oh, no, 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 no. We did have corruption, she said, but he's made it clear that corruption is not good for the country, so there's no more corruption. Now, uh, believe it or not, that's effectively what has occurred in recent times uh, because Kagame only began the corruption crusade, the anti-corruption crusade, in 2005, having been content with it from 1995 after the genocide to 2005, he was secure in his rule, and he was able to move forward. There's much more I can say. I don't want to go on too much longer, though. Um, but the key element, and we can talk about Botswana, if you want, in the question period, um, leadership is essential to turn countries from being corrupt to less, less corrupt. And we can demonstrate that in countries from 18th century Denmark to 21st century Rwanda. Now, the final point is we have a natural experiment in front of us. Uh, most of the countries I mentioned are small. China is now undergoing a massive experiment in how to shift a country from being wildly corrupt like Singapore and Hong, Hong Kong to conceivably being less corrupt. Forty generals are in jail, a hundred, hundred thousand or so cadres are in, are in jail. It is clear that corruption is not favored by the regime. Uh, we won't have answers to China for a decade or more. Uh, and Xi Jinping may become uh, a leader who lives on longer than his predecessors. Uh, if so, the corruption experiment may be successful, but if China can do it, then anybody else can follow suit. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Excuse me, Jody. Jody, you want to start? Oh, sure. Um, so I'll just keep my comments brief because I'm sure we all have have a lot to discuss here. Um, but I first want to say that um, I think this this book. Um, is a real contribution to the study of, of corruption because for so long we've been really looking as, as scholars and practitioners at the causes of corruption um, and trying to assess um, the causal dynamics that lead to this outcome. Um, but this pushes the debates forward in new ways by looking at what we can actually do about it. So, so it's much needed in that regard. Um, and I think that there's, real, there's two real strengths to the book. Um, the first is just the great synthesis that it provides um, to the study of corruption. Um, it gives, it's, it's very comprehensive in its scope, but at the same time, it's extremely accessible. Um, and so it really manages to synthesize a lot about what we know about what corruption is, how to measure it, um, and so a wide literature. But it's also broad in its scope in terms of historical cases um, and geography, um, as you just got a glimpse of. Um, it really is a tour de force in that sense. Um, the other thing that I think is, is really impressive about this book um, is the fact that Professor Rotberg manages to both acknowledge the difficulties of talking about corruption and trying to compare corruption and understand it cross-nationally, 
um, and he really engages with some of the gray areas that are involved. Um, but he also offers clarity on these subjects um, because so often our our analyses either go one go too far one one direction or the other, saying that there's either nothing we can say because this is such a complex topic um, with so many different nuances to it, um, or unfortunately, sometimes in the other direction, towards oversimplification. So this is a book that really grapples with that and manages to offer um, a clear way forward um, to getting, getting some purchase on these questions. So I think um, I just raised a couple of questions um, that I have uh, that we might discuss. I think, so as Professor Rotberg mentioned, the overall takeaway here is about the importance of political leadership. And that's so important um, and, and a real contribution in and of itself. But it does raise some questions. Um, and so I think amongst the questions um, that, that this book raises include, where does, where does this political leader come from? Um, how do you find the right leader for the job? Um, and, and when you really can, the conditions under which this leader can come to power. Um, and when we think about these reforms, on the one hand, um, effective anti-corruption reforms based on the cases uh, that are presented here involve both the commitment to anti-corruption um, reforms and eradicating corruption, as well as the opportunities to do so. Um, but in turn, that raises some challenges. Um, on the one hand, where does this commitment come from? Um, and we have some answers from the book. But at the same time, the opportunities that, that are necessary to make these huge reforms can also generate challenges even of themselves. Um, and here I'm thinking of the, the larger question that we often ask, which is who guards who watches the watchmen? Um, because I think there's a lot of cases out there where these real champions of corruption reforms um, who seem very committed and, and very may, may well be very committed to eradicating corruption in their country, essentially when they're given this leeway to make these reforms, often uh, are less effective and sometimes sucked into it themselves. So I think that that's really... Um, really one of the, the core challenges. How do we, how do we prevent <coughs> this, uh, this from happening um, and to really actually overcome and create not just the right political leaders but the right conditions for them to effectively move this forward? So those, those are the points that I would bring up. Thank you. Maya, please. Great. Um, well, thank you for, for coming and giving me the opportunity to read this fantastic book. Um, I, Jody's already chronicled some of its great strengths. Um, I just, I just want to highlight that I, the painstaking detail with which you chronicled the particular elements, and you end the book with a manual of the sort of 15 different things that um, leaders embarking on an anti-corruption crusade might want to do, that, that is a real contribution, and it's very, uh, it's very agency-focused, and that's a, a, a fresh departure from a lot of uh, focus on the structural conditions under which corruption is likely to uh, to, to um, besmirch a country. So um, that being said, and, and partly because um, I uh, I was one of those students, or I was a, I was a postdoctoral fellow in in Bob Center, the Interstate Conflict at Harvard, and I, he ran this very um, a uh, small group of fellows got together each week and, and critiqued each other's work, and he encouraged us to jump right in and be critical. Um, so that's what I'm going to do in the, in the interest of provoking a little bit dis of discussion. So um, the, the core of the argument, in, in a sentence, is that popular leaders can get popular opinion about corruption to collectively change, and they can do so by being the motivating impetus right, for, for establishing new norms of ethical universalism. And you write that this political leadership has to be active. It's not passive at all. It requires the full attention um, of, its, of its leaders. So there are three kind of questions and really critiques I want to make and, 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 and push you on a little bit. The first is that all of the, the cases in the book that you, that you highlight are cases of of success, right? So these are successful cases um, of, of countries that have managed to, to, to throw off the shackles of corruption and make this transition. Um, but you know, uh, you didn't say anything about the cases of near success. And to rigorously know what it is about these <coughs> countries, you see, yeah. you pull a set of countries and say, look, here are five countries. They all have strong political leaders. 
to really make that case, I think you also needed to show me that near successes were we're, we're really suffering from a lack of leadership, right? And I think that, I, I wonder whether that's really the case, and I wondered if you could talk a little bit about near failures where we, it was really yeah. political leadership was lacking, and that was the critical thing that, that, um, that made the difference. So, you know, political leadership was also, let's say, um, a key ingredient in the Indian national movement, Gandhi being a, 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 a leader that fit all of the criteria and who I immediately thought of as you, as you distilled these characteristics. But he failed to root that in, in India. And I just I wondered if you would say a little bit more. The reason I think this is not just a methodological critique, but, a, um, but this is a critique that matters, is because you make the, you, you sort of skirt around this claim, um, but you do say, look, you know, a lot of leaders that are able to do all of these things are autocratic leaders. And I, I think you sort of, you, you know, you, you, you say that at some points, you never come out and directly say, often you need the centralization of power. And I want to push you on that a little bit again, because if you look at all the, the success countries that, that you highlight, they all do have strong leaders. Um, but so do a lot of the countries, you know, the centralization of power is also a characteristic of countries that don't do well on corruption. Or in other words, if you look at, the, the most successful countries in the world on growth, on, on human development. Yes, many of the top countries will be, um, that the ones that have improved will be autocratic regimes, but will, so will be the ones at the bottom. So I think this is driven by kind of the very common critique in the, in the, kind of in the press about India and China, and India has this you know, sort of messy politics, and China is much more centralized, but China has been able to deliver results. We talk about it a lot in our classes here, but in the end, <laughs> right, so we have to really trade off, and I think you, you brought this up when, when you talked about China. Um, are, we, you know, are, are we sort of focusing excessively on the cases of success, using them to justify potentially autocratic forms of governance, and actually, not if you get an autocratic form of government, you might not be able to deliver on corruption because just, just as many of them don't. And that's, that's kind of the first, the first question I want to push you on. <laughs> the second is that you say that great leaders are born, not made. Well, right. I, I don't actually say right. that. So, Lee, Lee Kuan Yew says yes, that. Yes, right, right. Well, you embrace, but I think you embrace that philosophy. That'd be fair to say. Okay, okay. Maybe you don't. So maybe you can. You, but I, that, I read no, I it. Say, I say specifically somewhere that I disagree with Lee oh, on you, that. Okay, uh, I missed that. But Sorry. but that's okay. That's right. <laughs> so I'm going to push you, but still on this, that you you write that the countries that have. Uh, improved corruption records, so the four ones that are, that are recent that have made these right. changes. You write Rwanda, Liberia, Georgia, <coughs> and Montenegro. Um, and you, you, you write that it's, I'm leaving away Macedonia because you say that it's kind of a mixed case. And you said, look, these all had these transformational leaders. But when I looked at each of those, and I read about each of those cases, what I thought was striking is that they all had what Barrington Moore would call revolutionary breaks right before transformational leaders came into power. So in Rwanda, you of course had the genocide in 1994. You had a period of consolidation of power by Kagame. That's a big break from the past. Liberia, you had 17, or 14 years of civil war that ended in 2004. Sirleaf comes to power in 2006. Georgia, you have the Rose Revolution in 2003. 2004, the reforms begin. And in Montenegro, you have the 2000 split, six split from Siberia after which reforms begin. So I think that does, to me, kind of beg this question of whether, whether, you, whether actually what, what, maybe it would be more accurate to say what's drawing from the cases that you chronicled, it's, it's maybe not that these transformation, that you need transformational leaders that are born or maybe that's not quite what you meant, but, but that corruption is rooted out when you have a combination of transformational leaders plus a real break from the regime that preceded it. Um, and then the third <coughs> question I have for you is that you write sort of, sort of smuggled into chapter eight that a whole host of structural conditions do matter. You write about size, wealth, being an island, um, for example. But one factor that you don't mention, and then I'm, I'm really interested in it because I'm thinking a lot about this question today, is, is national unity. Mm -hmm. um, 
So, and you write, you know, strong national unity underpins capable states, political scientists from, you know, Dahl and Poliarchy have written that for a long time. But I, especially as we think about the case of Singapore, which assumes a, a very, you know, it's a pivotal case for you in the book. It's the case that goes from the most extreme, you know, it makes the most extreme change in the, in the 20th century. Plus Hong Kong. Plus Hong Kong. But I, you know, I don't, so for, for Singapore, what was interesting to me that is that Lee Kuan Yew right was part of the uh, Singapore was part of the Malay Federation, and that it's actually the you know he writes in part that it's the experience of being part of the Malay Federation and the the very deep ethnic tensions that he experienced that then led him to really construct this very you know with the same with the same raw ingredients of Malay Chinese Indians to create a highly constructed national identity. So I wonder whether you know, national, having a national unity or creating some sort of national unity is also somehow um, intertwined with what these transformational leaders do. So I will leave it at that. Thank you, Maya. Robert, please. Uh, these are Jody's questions and uh, Maya's questions. I'm sure Bo has some as well are very important ones because they cut to the very heart, not only of the book, but of thinking about these kinds of issues, leadership issues, state failure issues, all kinds of things that are very important. Uh, uh, leaders, Leaders may arise spontaneously. That's what Lee Kuan Yew calls about them being born. But that was self-reverential. He knew he was a leader when he was at Raffles High School. He knew that he was going to be important. He married the woman who was ahead of him in the ranking in class in order to consolidate leadership. Um, and they lived and they've had a powerful um, family regime. Uh, his son is prime minister. His son went to the Kennedy School. Uh, Singaporeans come regularly to the Kennedy School. Now they'll be coming here, I'm sure. Uh, uh, so, but the question, Jody's question is very important because uh, I disagree very strongly with Lee Kuan Yew, that leaders are somehow born. They're also nurtured by their experiences. If Suretsi Kama hadn't gone to Balliol and been exiled by the British government from the paramountcy of the Bamangwato in Botswana, you can all see the movie, which I haven't seen, about this period, but the British government did Africa and Botswana, an enormous service by keeping Sir Suretsi in this country for an added six or seven years. Balliol, Inns of Temple, eventually, after exile, home to rule, 1966, he arrived in this um, barren uh, country with no diamonds at that point, no prospect of diamonds. Britain's gift to Botswana on independence in 1966 was an abattoir because there was no way for cattle to be slaughtered and shipped to Europe except through South Africa. So the abattoir made enormous difference. But that's all that Suretsi had. And he decided that what was wrong with Africa, this was his analysis, that's why his leadership wasn't born, it was nurtured and created, he looked around Africa and saw that Kwame Nkrumah had um, defaulted on his leadership qualities and had turned Ghana into a corrupt entity. He looked at neighboring Zambia and it saw, saw that Kenneth Kaunda was not, even though a good man, was not powerful enough to keep corruption from destroying Zambia from, from within. And he went to see Julius Nereri, Edinburgh educated, and he realized that even saintly Julius was permitting corruption throughout Tanzania. So he said, not here, not in Botswana, because A, we're too poor, 
to permit corruption because it will kill us, and B, because we have to set an example to this horrible South African apartheid that uh, surrounds us, and that was corrupt, despite something we may have learned elsewhere, was a corrupt entity at various levels. So Soretsi was intent on uh, creating a, um, a model African state. And lo and behold, 1966 to 2017, the only really successful mainland African state is Botswana. 7% GDP growth a year for several decades. There is some corruption, but not much. And it's been mostly contained by Sir Suretsi and by the two presidents that followed him. Um, and now by Suretsi's son. Uh, and, but, the, the, but if you go into the university and you ask students to raise their hands, you'll get one or two hands maybe who have had experience in South Africa. But if you push them, you won't get any who have been asked for a bribe within Botswana. Nor is, are, are there large-scale bribery. This is a democratic country, of course, so no autocrats. Um, what's happening in Croatia, even in Romania, query mark, query mark, uh, certainly under Sh Shakishvili in Georgia for a brief period, you had anti-corruption effectively developed by people who analyzed what was going on in the past and realized the way forward was to be non-corrupt. Non now, in addition to Xi Jinping, we have another natural experiment that's 15 months old, which is Tanzania. John Magafuli, who was a, basically a technocrat, and he was a placeholder. They expected him to be a temporary president, uh, filling in because there wasn't anyone ready to be president. His first week as president of Tanzania, he marched into the hospitals, made sure people were actually looking at patients, and, not, and that he made sure at 8 a.m. in the morning they were at work. He went to the bureau, bureau, bureaucratic offices, made sure people were there at 8 a.m. and also at lunchtime. And then has gone on, the experiment's not over, it's still continuing, gone on to make it very clear that Tanzania, a thoroughly corrupt place, was going to be as, as, as less corrupt. I don't think he succeeded very much, but he's had 15 months to use a leadership where we can say he was born, but we can also say he analyzed what was going on around him and saw as a leader he could make a difference. Now, I think what's a long answer to Jody's question is that with the rise of the middle class, what's happening in Africa and elsewhere is the shift from populism to um, more democratic values in the biggest voting bloc in many of these countries. Uh, Pew has done surveys, Afrobarometer has done surveys, and in the last 20 years, we've had a shift towards a growing middle class which can put pressure on even leaders such as Jomo, uh, such as uh, uh, President Kenyatta of Kenya, uh, to change the way in which they operate as leaders, which in turn can lead them to uh, promote and be active in the anti-corruption sphere. Kagame says that he's trying to make Rwanda into a little Singapore. It's ten times, it's, uh, sorry, it's three times the size of Singapore. Uh, but he also wants Rwanda to be an outpost of anti-corruption in the East African Federation area that he's, he's attempting to, he, that he's effectively muscled into and now wants to lead. So he's, again, someone that wasn't born, 
he is an autocrat uh, in ways that are very unpleasant at times. Um, but you do need a strong leader, even if a gentle leader, as in Suretsi's um, place. Now, Maya had several other questions, which she will, I hope, remind me of. The first one was... The first one was about um, the, the sort of selection of the cases. Oh, the selection of the cases, yeah. Yeah, yeah no, this is a, another very important question. Um, I was saying to Bo at lunch that um, South Africa wouldn't be in the parlous position it is today if Mandela had stayed on for a second term. He stepped down in 1999. In 1997, he gave really control over South Africa to Thabo and Mbeki. Mandela had, um, by his personal example and by his knowing what was right from wrong, uh, established a non-corruption beginning. Thabo and Becky, for reasons which we still have to tease out, decided in 2001 to open the floodgates of corruption. He let Matthews Posa, uh, the leader of one of the uh, provinces of so South Africa, engage in wholesale corruption that encouraged others to be corrupt, and corruption went the wrong way. That was a divide that I think that's a, a case that could have been successful, but we'll never know. And we'd have to go into the weeds to really tease some of this out. Now, looking at, looking at other, I think Maya's question is, what are the almost successful cases that failed? because of structural reasons. Oh, because uh, of leaders, because leaders that... Right. Uh, we would have to look, I would have to look at um, some American post-Civil War cases. One would have to look at New York uh, early Tammany Hall versus late Tammany Hall, for good examples. Mm -hmm. One would have to look at Buffalo in the 1920s, for, for good examples of, of where leaders really couldn't get it together or were thrown out of office at various times. In looking around the world today, I don't see or else I would have used those cases which could have been successful, but the leaders uh, failed at being so. Uh, I think some test cases right now uh, that, 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 bless you, uh, that could also be brought in are Romania, um, Croatia, um, China being the big case. We don't know what's going to happen at the Congress in October. I assume Xi Jinping will consolidate his rule. I assume he's going to rule longer than the standard 10, 10 years that he'll be in power 15 years from now. That's what I assume. And he'll, he'll have plenty of time to to make the case. Now, your second point was? The, all the cases you chronicle have sort of a, a revolutionary moment. Oh, for, trans right transformational, before. yeah. I don't, oh, that's not, that's not really the case for um, Botswana. It's not really the case for Singapore or Hong Kong. We, the, we can say that, yes, there was a shift, but it was a leadership-directed shift. Look, it would have been extremely easy for Lee Kuan Yew, Suretsi Kama, and Governor Murray, Sir Murray Makalos in Hong Kong to have said, hey, look, corruption is, hasn't served us badly. These places are going along. And Lee could have said, look, it's too much trouble. I will be corrupt and I'll be around for 10 years and then, then something will happen. Suretsi, as a paramount chief, had rational legitimacy. He, there was no reason why he couldn't have fattened his calf as virtually all other African leaders had done. Another very interesting case is uh, Mauritius, which has had the most changes of government of any uh, 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 member of the African Union, is a mixed uh, Creole, African, uh, Hindi, um, Tamil nation, similar in some ways to Singapore, um, 
uh, which has had these changes of government and has had a strong rule of law from, the, from 1965, from 1969, from the beginning, and has had leadership. First, Sir Siragusa Sir Ram, Ramgulam, later his son, later the opposition, who've come in and taken the notion that Mauritius couldn't survive by being corrupt. And they had to extend to the mixed population uh, the rights of citizenry and the rights of being anti-corrupt in a way which um, uh, made Mauritius the success story that it is. Growth since independence. Uh, it's the only country that exports wool fabric and has never seen a sheep. <laughs> we should let some questions from the floor, please. Anyone? Yes. I'm surprised that you think that um, a powerful leader can abolish um, corruption because corruption is always done in total secrecy. I mean, you may suspect for years and years, but to find anything out is uh, and immediately kind of, or within a, a reasonable time, uh, make the country uh, straight and honest is, is pretty hard from the top. And what causes corruption? starts from the absolute bottom. It starts from thinking that what you're paid is not enough. You, you tip and you give presents. People give presents because they hope they'll get a bit of job and this and that. Tip, those are the kind of absolute bottoms of corruption. But unless you, you start with that, it just gets bigger and bigger. And what you, um, you might, well, one said you might have wanted a Persian carpet, and, uh, but then it's a question of a million dollars or I mean, it looks up and I think that um, uh, that's all I want to say. <laughs> Please. Thanks, well, um, Robert, I found your conclusion a bit disturbing uh, because I think we seem to be saying that really the key to curing corruption is the autocratic leader. Uh, and my question is, is the link there essentially political funding? Because the autocratic leader doesn't need political funding, and that's really the key driver of you know, big corruption uh, in a lot of um, uh, emerging countries where institutions are quite weak. I wonder um, if you've also looked at the issue of political funding in the developed countries like, like the US, etc., and what is the cure there? Um, you know, we've been reading some of the recent research in terms of uh, the cost to the US economy of um, the, the activities of lobbyists, etc. And thirdly, whether you've looked at the case of Indonesia, because that seems to be a country that's trying to combat or transition away from, from uh, um, heavy corruption without having an autocratic leader. It's slow, uh, but it does seem to be making progress by uh, strengthening institutions. Thank you. Hi. Um, uh, thank you very much for, for your uh, brilliant presentation. My name is Sergio. I'm from Brazil. And I'm a visit visiting fellow here at the Blavatnik School of Government. But I'm also a practitioner from Brazil. I work for the government auditing institution. And, uh, and you cited the case of Brazil. And then you, I think we know that Brazil is uh, in a very strong fight against corruption. But this fight is, uh, is led by institutions, from my point of view. And, not by a leadership, by a leader. So, but uh, my impression is that this, the, uh, uh, this fight started because institutions like the judges, the judge courts, and prosecutors, <coughs> auditing organizations, transparency became stronger and powerful. And then they started this fight against corruption. And, uh, but uh, at the same time, the leadership in Brazil is, is weak. 
in the sense of having the commitment to fight corruption. So, uh, uh, so I was just wondering about the uh, a, a different direction in the, in the fight against corruption, in the sense that they, they, uh, uh, stronger institutions creates an environment in which uh, 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 leaders and leadership can have the freedom to, to create or to sustain this, this reform and this, this movement against corruption. That's just, just a comment, and I'd like you to, to hear your, your opinion about that. Thank you. Robert, do you want to answer any of these sure, questions? Sure, of course. Uh, I've just spent the last year in Brazil. Uh, and I want, first of all, to say that this gentleman comes from one of the best auditing oper governmental auditing operations in the world. Uh, there are audits uh, periodically of municipalities. There are 5,500 municipalities in uh, Brazil, and they do a sample, municipal audits. But as in most countries, the results of the audits don't get published, don't get publicized, so we don't know. And they're submitted to parliament, and parliament in most countries, Brazil, says thank you and then puts the paper aside, and that's the end of the auditing trail. So there are very few places that have done what the public protector has done within the last two years in, in uh, South Africa. So the institutions in Brazil are very good on paper, uh, but uh, what Judge Morrow realized in the 13th Judicial Court of Paraná State when he accidentally was given a lav the Lava Jato cases in 2014, was that he was opening up a, uh, a huge set of cases which led all the way to the top, to the beloved President Lula da Silva. And so this month, there'll be the first of many uh, judgments as to whether Lula da Silva goes to jail uh, for corruption. And corruption, to answer the first question, just take a moment out, corruption always begins at the top, doesn't begin at the bottom. We can explain the syllogism there, but nobody in the world is corrupt unless their superior is corrupt and unless it keeps going, going up. Now in Brazil's case, it's a long story, but I believe the corruption trail began with Vargas, the first the elected leader, then the dictator, and then the elected leader again, and, and continued through the military era, which was less corrupt, and continued as, as Judge Morrow is attempting to demonstrate with prosecutors through Lula da Silva's period and not now into Temer. Um, and so leadership, the next leader of Brazil, in, strengthened by civil society and by the protest movements, the civil society in the streets that the middle class and educated class is leading, will have to be anti-corrupt. And that leader will presumably be at least partially successful, maybe will fail but will attempt to move the needle of Brazil from wildly corrupt to thoroughly corrupt. Uh, what the Batista revelations are just, just at the tip of the iceberg. And so Brazil under the next leader, 2018 on, might be a new place. Likewise in South Africa, if one of two contenders for the presidency is elected uh, by the party this year, it's conceivable that the South Africa can move back to the Mandela probity. Now, I I Indonesia is a very interesting example uh, because Joko, uh, the, pres the president of Indonesia, has uh, made uh, moves to uh, establish a non-corrupt or anti-corrupt uh, uh, 
presidency and then has backed off. So he, he could be an example of, of Maya's question about uh, failures of leadership to, to move forward. He appointed the wrong person to be head of the anti-corruption agency. The anti-corruption agency exposed that person and media did as well. He took that person out and moved another person in. It's, and, and the details are complicated, but, but Indonesia is much more successful at some levels of anti-corruption than people realize, but doesn't have the full buy-in yet of the military and doesn't have, and therefore doesn't have the full buy-in of citizenry. So Indonesia hasn't gone the transformative revolution, the societal change of moving the collectivity from tolerating corruption to not tolerating it. And that's a fundamental um, societal change that has gone on in these success cases that may be going on, I, I, I'm not partial to it enough to know, to, in uh, Croatia, which is not where I would have expected it to happen, and, um, and in some other Balkan states. Um, and and uh, Indonesia may be one of these places that over the next 10 years will succeed, but a lot depends on Joko and maybe his successor, but Joko is, has, has um, um, consultative, in, consultative instincts and means to do the right thing, whether he can. He failed in the uh, governorship race, uh, uh, but uh, we will see. This is, this is in motion, and some of Maya's hypotheses can be tested in, in Indonesia over the next five or six years. Thanks. Uh, I put myself on the list. I will let Good. you also. Good. Uh, I, and I want to continue my <laughs> discussion about democracy and corruption here. Not only are all these cases of successes not really kosher uh, democracies. Except for Botswana. Yeah, which is a very small country, two million people. But we also have quite a number of elections where corrupt leaders are re-elected again and again. And one of the most, and we know that the curve is kind of U-shaped, so uh, the most corrupt countries are actually new democracies. But there are a number of quite old democracies that are also quite corrupt. Mm -hmm. And there seems to be one thing that many governments in newly democratized countries cannot resist, and that is using the power of the state to fill with their political supporters. So, uh, uh, and this is, of course, one of the most common types of corruption. And the variation is just gigantic. I'm, I'm trying now to get numbers on this. If there is a government shift tomorrow in Mexico, 70,000 civil servants have to leave. In Brazil, I think it's about 20,000. In the U.S., 4,500. And then there is this slogan in develop research, you know, getting to Denmark, the best guy. In Denmark, that's the lowest figure I found. It's 26. So that is, there you have the spam, you know. So what to do with this problem that, and this is, of course, what has plagued much of South Africa, that they simply sent home all the old bureaucrats, gave them a golden handshake, and then filled it with their political cronies. And once you get this started, it's extremely difficult to break that circle because why should a new government trust that the next government won't just do the same again? So how do you break this circle of yeah, political nepotism or cronies? I had one question over here, please. And yeah, you, I will let you in, my, and then one up. Please, yes. Yeah, so my uh, question is, what is the role of the private sector, particularly the business community, in your various success stories? Um, because you did talk about buy-in from civil society and the citizenry, so in particular, I'm interested in that aspect. <coughs> An exemplary short question. Thank you. Yeah, my name is Adi. <laughs> I'm an MEP candidate. Uh, my question is about um, the 
sort of like the regular narratives in most countries in Africa. I use Nigeria as a case in point. Anytime you have a new government that is so um, long on, you know, anti-corruption, the usual reaction from, especially from your position, is that, you know, uh, uh, the anti-corruption crusade is used to witch hunt them. You know, you typically you find the ruling party, you know, using um, anti-corruption as a sort of like a whip to, you know, get the, um, the opposition in line. Usually, and that sort of discredits it. I'm just curious to know if in countries that have made um, a progress regarding anti-corruption, if well, how did they overcome, you know, that sort of impartiality, you know, that impartiality or do to ensure that uh, whether you're in the ruling party or you're in the opposition, you know, uh, the same rules applies to, you know, to, to, to all parties. And Maya? I, I just wanted to, to two-finger booze, but also bring you back to Nazir's question about um, autocracy and democracy and you know the, 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 two, the two cases you talk about the two cases to watch which are exemplary are or one of the two cases two, two, two countries that you think are are, uh, are are really interesting in this in this potential takeoff phase for moving to the not tolerating corruption are China and Rwanda they're both led as you said by <coughs> strong men who are using the anti-corruption drive as a way to silence opposition. So I just think one has to be really, you know, real, that's happening at the same time under the guise of anti-corruption, which of course gets a lot of international um, applause, and, um, and the, the effect of that is to further entrench autocratic regimes. So I just think that we have to be really careful about, about, about those claims. I think that Final words. yeah. Well, I, I think that last point is is, is very important um, because not only are the, the 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 two autocrats you mentioned, but the there are democratic impulses that are anti-corrupt. Ghana, Mauritius, continuing, Tanzania. So autocracy is not necessary for corruption, but it's very helpful because it makes people <laughs> pay attention and makes things happen more rapidly. But remember, uh, it, it, it's be very, you can call Singapore a conformist state, you can conform it a tightly controlled state, you can call it a state that uses libel laws punitively, in the early years, you wouldn't have called it an anti-democratic state. You might now, although now we're, Singapore's moving rapidly. <coughs> and Hong Kong was a British colony, so that's a separate case. So I don't think one need <coughs> Joko to be a Socarno for anti-corruption to win in, in uh, because uh, Joko's predecessor was m trying to be anti-corrupt without much much success. <coughs> he was also trying to be more democratic than his predecessors. Um, um, chapter nine in the book has a long section on what the corporate response is, <coughs> and it it. Uh, really points out that uh, corporations can make a huge difference on the demands, on the satisfying the demand side, and that there are many legal constraints in this century that didn't exist in previous times. So corrupt, uh, <coughs> corporations are under much tighter watch than ever. Uh, World Bank has an integrity initiative which blacklists corporations from bidding on World Bank contracts if their fingers are dirty. <coughs> the Foreign, Anti uh, Foreign Corrupt Practices Act of the U.S., the, uh, as amended in, in 1988, uh, yeah, will catch anyone, including FIFA, that has laundered money through the U.S., has used U.S monetary uh, facilities. So it's a very strong, strong instrument. British anti-bribery legislation and the serious fraud office is now much more important. Um, <coughs> what else? Uh, Bose 
Bo's question was um, just give me a quick restatement. The political appointments of new. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They feel the same <coughs> with their political crowds, basically. Yeah. Um, look, clientelism is alive and well in large parts of the world. Patrimonialism uh, is a fact of life. But the shift to an anti-corrupt collectivity from a corrupt collectivity or corrupt stance happens when the civil service is not automatically removed when a new ruler comes in. And that's in large part why New Zealand made the move from corruption to anti-corruption 1890s to 1920, why Australia did a little bit later than New Zealand. And in Canada, again, a civil service leadership made the transition from corruption to anti-corruption possible. And, of course, Bowes worked on this, many of his colleagues and I have done some work on it. In the Nordics, uh, a lot of the critical movement was from buying and selling offices to being merit meritocratic. And that go went along with... Uh, Bo and I might have a s separate discussion on this with um, greater education, greater education in home language, that is from Latin to, or from German in the case of Denmark to Danish and so on. The beginning of the folk schools were very important in Denmark, as were the shift from um, state Christianity to folk Christianity. So the evangelical movement was also very important. And uh, this, this all took, took an enormously long time to work out in quieter times. And uh, the point I make, and I make it here much too briefly, is that people like Lee Kuan Yew, the governor of Hong Kong, Sir Tsikama, did, uh, made what happened in the Nordics compress into a decade or two. And conceivably, China can do the same. Um, Kagami's done this already. And to, to shift a mentality, and the important thing is to make sure the top is clean, then the next level clean, then the next level cleans itself, and eventually the policeman on the beat has no one to give his proceeds to, and he's punished as well and he's prevented from doing it. So the, the, the f final point I would make is there's a great book, uh, what's it called, um, Let Us, uh, it, it's, it's Time to Eat, which is the story of Kenyan corruption and of a bold uh, anti-corruption campaigner. Um, that's what's happening still today in Kenya. So uh, a Uhuru Kenyatta may be the person to make the shift from having his hands up to his, uh, sorry, his arms up to his armpits in, in corruption to being turning to clean hands. And if he does it, it will be because he recognizes that his legacy, his future is better in that way. Uh, that's what has happened maybe to Magafuli. That's what's happening in other parts of the world. And I think deep down Xi Jinping understands that, yes, he can be anti-corrupt, get rid of his enemies, but he could also make China, make a huge difference in China the way Deng Xiaoping made a difference. And that will be his legacy in changing the way in which China operates. And so someone who was not known for anti-corruption in Shanghai and in Fujian is now making that his position in the world as a, as a way of uh, making China the leader of the world. I wouldn't say free world, but the leader of the world. That's Xi's goal, and this is an instrument. Anti-corruption is an instrument, but it could transform China. 
Okay. Thank you very much. A big time. <laughs> and thank you for coming. Thank you.